Hi everyone, my name is John Risen, and this is the wonderful Richie English with me today. And uh, we're here to talk about what even is classical singing. It's a weird topic, and it's something that um, in my own personal life I like sharing my story because I didn't grow up really with classical music. It's something that came to me later in life and has become my full-time career and has inspired travels across the world and, and what I continue to do. And so there's that question, what even is classical singing? A lot of people um, have an opinion on that. And, you know, some people think that, you know, oh, well, I heard that 12-year-old girl sing on that one show, and it, she had a wobbly voice, so that must be classical singing. And there's validity to that. Or, oh, I heard, you know, someone sing opera, or I heard someone sing Phantom of the Opera. Or there's all these opinions out there. And I like kind of tying it together and, and kind of sharing what the different shades are that I've experienced to kind of inform um, how they're all kind of the same. It's really the, the medium that you see them through that, that people have kind of segregated into little chunks. And so I'm going to start this with just three ideas to keep in mind over the course of what we do, and we'll kind of touch on all of them. There are really three kinds of classical singing that, that are still happening today. There's opera singing, which is you know opera and oratorio, which is holy works sung in an operatic style. We won't really talk about that, but it's fun to mention. That's like the Messiah, if you've heard of that. Like, hallelujah, that's an oratorio. Um, but opera, of course, is the original musical theater that comes from Europe 400 and some years ago from Italy, and it went across into France and Germany and Russia, and it continued to pervade the world till it came over to the U.S. But then, the, in the United States, we wanted our own tradition. So we created musical theater, which is the same thing, until technology comes into play. And that's something we'll talk about later as we get into certain genres. When technology came into play, musical theater changed from being identical to opera to being a slightly different genre. And then the more modern we get, we have different kinds of musical theater that lead into popular music and jazz and other, other forms of music. Um, and then third is what's called classical crossover. And that's really just concerts. Um, people doing what I'm doing here today, sharing different genres at the same time. And that genre has become a big thing, and it's been pervaded by, like, Andrea Bocelli, Sarah Brightman, these big names um, who sing in many genres, but you hear that same quality of sound just outside of the medium where it is. So, who am I, and why am I talking to you? <laughs> I, <laughs> I'm John. I, uh, I grew up playing baseball. That's very important to me for everyone to know, especially for the younger people, because I did not grow up playing instruments. I did not grow up in choir. I did not grow up doing the musical. I grew up playing baseball. And I was that guy. You know, I, I was a pitcher. I loved it so much. Um, I still kind of, my mannerisms are still very much that, and it's helped me in my career that I have this kind of, you know, baseball player gait and, and kind of vibe to me. It's very much helped me in the classical music world to be this athletic guy. Um, but I was introduced to classical music later in high school. And it was at that point where I, I was just floored by what I experienced. And it was kind of in a, a, a venue like this. I had a real opera singer sing for me this close. And I'll try at one point, if the, if the tech people won't get too mad at me, when I get to the end high note of this first song, I will not do it into the mic. So you'll see that it's not the mic that's making me loud. It's me making me loud. And it blew my mind. I'm a young athlete. Everything I cared about was like how hard I threw and how far I could throw and you know how, how hard I could hit. And then you hear a human making sounds that you cannot believe this close to you and your, your ears are going like mm. and I said wow that's the most, uh, most athletic thing I've ever I've ever heard and it inspired me so greatly and I, I started taking voice lessons and and my path began I'll talk about that a little bit later but um, it's very interesting that I fell into opera considering I'd never seen an opera before I walked into this life and um, you know what is an opera for the young people here opera just really is the Italian word for work a musical work um, and it's the tying together of dance singing acting lighting design costumes I mean it's what you'd expect when you see a musical but it's the original form it's the form where they 400 years ago had no microphones they would stand up there and they would tell a story while singing and that's that's the tradition of opera and it's started in Italian, but it's in hundreds of languages now, um, including Eastern languages, and they've adopted it too, and it's kind of amazing to see how this art form has kind of spread. But it's becoming less and less known about in America in the modern day and age, probably because of the popularity of musical theater, 
but I am of the opinion that they're not different genres. <laughs> they're just approached differently, and I want to show you that over the course of, of this little get-together we're having. So let's start with a little singing, because I think that's also important to understanding what I'm talking about. And so I want to start with a very, very, very famous operatic tune called La Donna Immobile, and I bet all of you, including the little people, have heard this tune, and it's because it's one of the most famous tunes since its inception almost 200 years ago. And um, I won't tell you what it's about, because that doesn't really tie into what this talk is about. But just notice the type of singing, the things you hear that make it different, right? You'll hear that vibrato, that thing that everyone's so scared about with opera. And I'll talk about why that's essential for being heard. Um, and so this is by Giuseppe Verdi, La Donna Immobile, and I'm just going to do a little snippet of it for you with the help of the amazing Richie English. La donna è mobile, qual più mai la vento, muta da cento e di pensiero. Sempre una mobile, leggia traviso, in pianto in riso, e menzognero. La donna è mobile, qual più mai la vento, muta da cento. And so... <laughs> It's funny, most of us fell in love with th that particular art form because it's so similar to musical theater. I mean, it's just characters acting, having fun, trying to make the audience feel something, and you're just doing it in a different vein. Now, what made that different than other things you've heard, right? Well, the language was not English. That's a big one. And that was tough for me when I started because I did not speak Italian, which that was Italian. Uh, when I began singing, and I had to learn. I had to learn the language. I, I had to get taught phonetics and how <clears throat> the language you know, was different from English and how I had an accent that I didn't know I had <laughs> and I had an accent in Italian that I didn't know I had and I had to learn how to get rid of my accent in Italian and, and understand my accent in English. And it was a very fascinating process that I had in early college. Um, but Italian, okay, that's, that's different already. But you've probably heard other languages because there are movies and, oh my gosh, at any TV show now, the scores have all sorts of languages, which is amazing. Um, but okay, what else is different than perhaps another genre, like rock or country? Definitely the volume, the, the length of the notes you hold, and then, of course, the vibrato. The vibrato is one vibrato, which is the oscillation of the waveform. That one always freaks people out. And especially if I'm in a microphone, I'm like, ah, you're like, well, why are you doing that? And, and it's because we live in an age of recorded media. We live in an age where we can put on our earbuds, we can go take out our phone, go on Spotify, and we click the button, and we, we're out there listening to whatever music we want. And it's perfect. The technology is amazing that we have access to, and you can make absolute art with this technology. And so people are like, well, then why are you waving your voice like that? It's... it's, it's some people say it's very, it's too powerful. You're in your earphones. You don't want this like ah, thing in your ear. You know, I, I understand that. I mean, I get it. I get it. But why? Why? Well, if you think about it, before microphones, someone would be standing on a stage and you wouldn't be this close. You would be 150 feet away. And you've paid for your tickets like at Shays or like at Kleinhans. You're, you're in the balcony at Kleinhans. This is a great example if you've ever been there. And there's no microphone. What do you do then? <laughs> oh, hi, can you hear me? Like, you don't have the help, so you have to project your voice in a certain way. Well, sound travels in waves. Physics has taught us this. 
the higher range, the higher a pitch, the easier it is to carry in a space. And um, the lower a pitch, the louder it can be up close, but the harder it is to hear further away. And so in opera, you'll notice that the range is also higher. And so that's why you hear these differences in singing when you hear classical singing. Now, OK, let's move one step forward. Now we've come to our country, the US, if you're from here, like I am, and we have musical theater. And a lot of people think that they're different than opera. And I, that's one that gets me. Yes, some, there are some rock operas and there are some you know, modern shows that are like jukebox operas where you're just reflecting on the, the greatness of a pop artist or the greatness of a rock artist and stuff like that. And I understand those are specific to their genre. But otherwise, I truly think that classical singing carries over into that. And a great example is the show Les Miserables. I don't know if you've heard of this show. I'm about to in, we're going to introduce you to one of my favorite moments of it. But essentially, this show has no dialogue in it. There is no dialogue, which is usually a big, um, for, for operetta, which is the British version of musical theater, and um, musical theater, you typically have dialogue into a song, into dialogue into a song. You know, whether it's The Lion King or something like that, you have people talking, and then a fun song happens. That's the form of musical theater and operetta over in, in, um, in England. But Les Miserables is a famous, famous, famous musical with zero words spoken ever. It is sung from start to finish. And it's in a style that is not very popular, pop music. It's extremely orchestral, the score, and, and then the vocalism is extremely operatic. And so I like showing this because I sing this all the time professionally as a person who does classical singing. I've sung it with symphonies, I've sung it with piano. It's the same exact genre, except sometimes I have this thing, this magical instrument, and you can sing in a different part of your voice. And so instead of me having to be loud all the time, I get to be as loud as I need to be to communicate the character of what I'm doing. And what is unique about this song compared to the first song that I shared with you is the different parts of your voice you can use when you have technology. Because while Les Miserables is operatic in scope in terms of the orchestration, in terms of the range of the singers, in terms of the action happening on stage, it does get technology. You do have a microphone when you do it. And I have a microphone here. And so what you hear is I get to use a part of my voice I don't get to use when I sing operatically. I get to use my falsetto, which is a higher place in my voice that's soft and light. And outside of the mic, you'd barely hear. But in a mic, it sounds just as full. And I get to sing in a range that communicates the text, which is very important for theater. You need to understand the words to understand the plot, just like any movie or any you know Netflix show you've ever seen. If you don't understand what you're <laughs> watching, it's pretty hard to watch the show. Breathing is the heart and soul, or the engine, rather, of the singing mechanism, regardless of genre. You could be a pop singer, you could be a jazz singer, you could whatever. Breath, the human instrument, is very interesting because it's the whole body, right? And it's fascinating because we are both a string instrument and a woodwind instrument. A human has the vocal cords, which are strings that vibrate and resonate together to create sound. But what creates the sound and makes it go is the lungs, the body. And people talk about the diaphragm, which is a dome-shaped membrane that pushes. <laughs> it, it truly, involuntarily, when you breathe deeply, it goes down and it pushes out all the stuff in the way. Your intestines and all these things here get pushed out. And then the musculature also stretches out, which allows you to breathe even deeper. Deep breathing, your stomach always goes way out because the diaphragm pushes stuff out of the way. And that mechanism is one of the ways that humans use air to play a stringed instrument. Um, but when I was introduced to singing, it was my grandmother. Um, she decided to have all her grandkids get some kind of arts lesson. And I was the one who could not sing in my family. The common mistake that I was making that most young people make, or especially young athletic men, is I was too shy about my voice. My voice is heavy. I, I mean, Richie has given me some great words to describe what my voice can do. But my voice is big. And because my voice is big, it takes an amount of air and an amount of energy to make that thing work. And when I was a young guy, I'd you know, go to sing and be like, bring him on. 
home, which is very common for a teenage boy. To, that's the effort that I want to put in. And so I assumed I was bad at it, and everyone else did too, because I, that was what I showed them. And I got into these voice lessons, and the person was like, you play baseball, right? So yeah. Okay, so you're, you're on the mound, and, and there's people in the outfield. Do you ever talk to them? I'm like, oh, absolutely. I talk to them all the time. They're like, all right, guys, two down, man on first, okay. Hey, Jimmy, more left field. Okay, that's very normal. That's sports, sports talk. Now, what did I do, though? And that's what he asked me. He said, what did you just do? And I said, I don't know. I just shouted a little or whatever. He's like, well, <laughs> but why is that important to what we're talking about here in singing? He said, do you, did you realize that you involuntarily stood up straight? You went, you opened your throat, the larynx here, opened wide. And I went, all right, guys, to die, to Like, <laughs> I literally produced this sound that was a, like immediately healthy singing open. I gave it a ton of air because I was used to doing it. We were all actually used to doing it. You just, you you open your throat and you raise your voice. It's, you kind of create your Gaston voice if you know Beauty and the Beast. And it just comes out because it's natural to us. We've done it a million times in our life. I mean, how many times a day do we raise our voice? Mom, can you make me a sandwich? <laughs> you just did it. Now, how do you harness that into singing, right? That first song, when I hit that note at the end, that's a, for anyone who knows notes, that's a high B natural. That's a very hard note for most people to hit. And I held it for a long time, right? <laughs> I like that reaction. And so it's just tying that in. The human instrument is part of us. And singing is just kind of, as Pavarotti said, deliciously refined shouting. And then you learn how to harness that power into softer and softer singing. But that's one of the cool things about classical singing is you have every tool in the shed and yes, we tend to stay on one side of our, our tool shed, but because we have every tool, we can play and we can learn the different things. And that's something I've prided myself mm -hmm. in is genre crossing. Mm -hmm. and, and that's where classical crossover kind of comes into this. Where Hi, everybody. My name is Richie English. It's uh, an honor to be here and uh, especially working with somebody that I just love dearly, John Risen. John has a cosmic voice. When I say cosmic, it's because it, his voice encompasses space but it is bladed it cuts through things and in order to do that everything he's talking about with the science also comes with a healthy dose of confidence as well and confidence is not something you need to feel okay confidence my friends is an action word highest of praise uh, i also think highly of you as you know <laughs> but no he makes a strong point one of the biggest things that makes classical singing very different from popular singing, let's just take the two that are usually put at odds, and I don't like that they're at odds because they shouldn't be, is a lot of people who only know the popular side of music, they think that the classical side is too abrasive. It's too in your face. It's too powerful. Um, and then, of course, the classical side doesn't quite understand the instrumentation and stuff like that necessarily. And, and, you know, people butt heads. Music is music, and it's communicating emotions and stories and, and things to people for them to digest. And, and as he said, the, um, using the space around you to communicate is, is what classical singing really is. And that's why I fell in love with it, because the person up here, when I was you guys blew me away, and all they did was sing. They didn't know that I was there thinking how dumb it was that he was gonna sing this. And then I'm sitting there going, oh, that wasn't dumb at all. That was incredible. And then it caused me to do research and find the stuff I liked, and maybe I, I didn't go all the way to opera, certainly, but I, I was intrigued. I tried other things, and I found sounds. I went, oh my gosh, this is so cool. And it led me down a path to where I am now, where my, my literal job is to sing opera, oratorio, jazz, musical theater, classical crossover, symphonic works. And it's, it's a wider and wider and wider net of genres that I bring in just because I have the tools as a classical singer who took the time, it took 12 years of my life to get degrees and to train and to train and to train. I spent 12 years of my life training to then do what I do now all the time professionally. And that's, it's not genre specific, it's music specific. I just wanna communicate, and this is the way I feel I communicate best. My voice is like this, loud and, 
and uh, his word was cosmic. I like that, but that's I don't want to say it myself. Um, and so that, that's why the genre fell in. One of the basic things to do is ground yourself and get your body in a position to do what it knows how to do. For instance, going back to primal sound, a baby, when they're really crying, sometimes they hold that note, as it were, for a very long time, that, that singular wail. What, what happens a lot that's hard, and I've, I've worked on for years, is the throat itself is actually, it is a big part of singing, there's no denying that, but it's not as important as people think. And the first major mistake that I would say people make when they start getting into singing is making it all about the throat. I would say the, the, the actual singing instrument is more the body than it is the throat. And if you want to think of um, uh, any other instrument, you have your articulators, your embouchure, as it were, is your mouth, your, the lips, the teeth, the tip of the tongue. You're communicating small things up here, and you can, you know, a vowel only really changes by the shape of your lips and what your tongue does as it hits your teeth, or not. Like, e is just a small adjustment in the embouchure, in, in the articulators. Then, the, the air pipe ha contains the vocal cords, but the vocal cords just buzz. That's the magic of what the human instrument does. If you take vocal cords out of the human body, put them on a table, and uh, play, uh, send electric current to them as if the brain is telling them to sing, and they will go zzzz, like a cell phone. And that's the only sound they know how to make. So then where, how do we make this huge dynamic thing happen? It's all the rest of your body and the shape of your body, the, the amount of bone density, the amount of fat, the amount, everything changes the way your sound is created. So that's a long way of getting to my point. But for me, what I learned was one of the reasons why my um, pitch would dip, if it dipped, was because I wasn't in a position to let the air flow freely and consistently. And that's a very, very complex thing to figure out because I can't see it, you can't see it. I can't tell exactly how much PSI is coming out of this pipe at what time. There's no way to register that, but getting used to the feeling of like, no. Like, I happen to feel the space open and the air just is circulating slowly and I've gotten used to it. And the concept of leaning forward on your feet is just getting you in a place to feel that air circulating. And it's actually less about your ear because your ear is one of the reasons you go flat or sharp. But actually, your ears are just as much a problem in a moment like that because Richie was playing some extremely crunchy, dissonant chords over my held note. It would have been very easy for me to change my note to his notes because that's what I hear that just as well as you do. I hear those beautiful crunches happening and I'm holding the note that doesn't make sense for a time. But if I just feel it in my body and I feel the air and I, I relax, that's a hard one. Relax while doing something active. That's a big part of singing. But that's really what it is, I think, is grounding yourself and finding that place to just trust and relax and not listen to the note, but feel. It feels like this, and if it continues to feel like this, then it's the same note. But you have to trust your, your body to do it, and that's a huge part of singing. It takes years to get to a point where you feel like, no, I can stay in tune like 99.7% of the time if I'm not sick. <laughs> Because you have technology, you can widen the range of what you can do, and there's more, there's more sharing that can happen between the different types of singers because you have the great equalizer here. And then, of course, I have the wonderful Aaron back there helping me to sound better. And if he wanted to, he could probably change parts of my voice in front of you and make me sound even deeper or higher. Now, you get rid of the microphone. It is just me doing that. I have to be the sound engineer. I have to project. And one of the reasons this tradition, 400-year tradition, continued in the extremes of the voice types was because only in those parts of their voices could they be heard on a stage. And so while my voice is actually quite deep and has a lot of lower resonance, and so I can sing the music of the night, and it's fine. I've sung stuff like that. I, I was Gaston in Beauty and the Beast. That's one of my stage credits. And Gaston is like the baritone, like you know, like, it's true, LeFou, and I've got my sight set on that one. Like, he's a man. But I'm a tenor, and tenors sing high. It only matters if there's no technology. And that's one of the things, I think, that has caused the rift that I spoke about in the, in the genres, because people suddenly get their mind wrapped around, like, well, you shouldn't sing that, you shouldn't sing that. And I think, no, this is music. We're communicating. And 
I love doing multiple genres. And it doesn't matter that without a mic, I'm a tenor. If I can sing this song and communicate, I'm going to. And that's one of my big passions. And just like with movies and books, if you don't like one, you don't quit on the genre altogether. I don't like a lot of movies I've seen. And I love movies. And there's a lot of books I've stopped reading after the first few pages because they were bad. But I didn't stop reading books for the rest of my life. And there is a strange perception with music. I don't like country music because I heard these three twangy songs. Well, I have to say I was really schooled on that one because I didn't grow up with country music as an example. And then I went down to Nashville and I got to work with a Grammy-winning songwriter named Marcus Hummon who wrote, Every broken road led me to where you... Like, he was amazing. And he wrote an opera. But he had like 10 genres, and there was another guy who came in named Daryl Scott, this very, very famous guitarist, songwriter, Americana singer, who wrote for Tim McGraw and all these famous guys. And they sit down with their guitars and their piano, and they improv gorgeous harmonies and songs right on the spot, something I can't do. And I'm sitting there in tears, and I was like, I don't, I don't really listen to, to country music. Do you have suggestions for me? And it was a big, I mean, it was several years ago, it was a big educational moment for me. Even I, trying to be open-minded about music, had just decided because I wasn't used to it, that I couldn't listen to it. And it's, it's not that. It's not the genre that was the problem. Is I just didn't hear a song I liked. And then I was introduced to s artists who had voices that I liked and songs with stories that broke my heart or made me laugh. And suddenly I realized that is how everyone perceives music. And that's how people perceive opera. That's how people perceive theater. They go and they assume like I assumed. So I encourage people to, if you, if you have been of the opinion that you don't like a certain genre of music, and of course I'm preaching about classical music right now because that is my specialty, try, try again. There are many vo forms of it and you might find one that you love. So the very last story I want to tell you, and first of all, I just want to thank you all for this. I'm sorry I went so long, but I'm very passionate about sharing this. And it's something that I'm, I'm so honored to have been a part of WNED series and to share this. Because I think it's an undervalued part of the music scene. Um, but it's not, a, it's not a dead one. It's very, very much a... Um, popular is the wrong word because you could think I'm talking about popular music. But it is a popular genre that many people listen to predominantly. And, and I like connecting both sides back because these, my side of people can be a little, you know, a little closed-minded about this side and this side can be a little closed-minded about this side. And I like going, hey, it's all one thing. It's all music. It's all waves. It's all communicating. And so this last song is perhaps the most famous tenor aria in all existence. It's called Nessun Dorma. You may not know the name You'll probably recognize the tune. You'll probably recognize the ending because that's the part that I think is the most iconic. Um, and what's really interesting about this song in my life is that one of my big crossovers was into TV when I got a phone call and asked, hey, we need an opera singer to come on America's Got Talent and perform live for 50 million people. And we've been really struggling to find the right person. Are you able to do this? And I thought it was a scam. I was like, yeah, right. What? This is so dumb. What? And uh, slowly but surely, I was made aware that it was very real. Very real indeed. And so I got the honor of going and performing this song in front of, I think they said it was over 50 million people live. And then again, the broadcasts around the world and, and online and all that stuff. And it was a surreal experience because as an opera singer, I've loved this song, but then I got to communicate it to a whole new group of people. And uh, I'm trying to remember the quote that, that you wanted me to share. Would you share it? Simon says, in terms of the act, the acts of tonight, this is not the best act of the show tonight. And everyone's booing, boo, boo. This is the best act of the series. And it was opera. And it was the best act of the series. It was pretty sweet. And so that was the semi-final episode we won. Got to go on to the finals. Got to be a, a finalist with this group, a Metaphysic, who was just incredible for the technology they did. If you go find the video, the technology was the act, but then they used the, me the medium of singing and stuff to kind of do their act. <laughs> Tu pure o prin 
principessa nella tua fredda stanza guardi le stelle che tremano d'amore e di speranza ma il mio mistero è chiuso in me No, no, sulla tua bocca lo dirò Quando la luce splenderà Ed Bacio scioglierò il silenzio che ti fa mia.